there's been times where it feels like I'm going to get blown over. Luckily, it hasn't happened yet. But yeah, if the wind is strong enough, it'll it'll blow us back and forth. Our, our bodies actually will will be blown back and forth, um, which makes it pretty hard to hit. You know, the size of your pinky nail target 50 meters away. <laughs> Mesdames et messieurs, the greatest festival of our contemporary society, the Olympic Games, is about to begin. This is going to be close. Oh! They're all completely gassed. They've given it everything on the global bucket. Oh, yeah! Oh! Oh! Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. But that is an Olympic champion. Ready? Hello, fans of Shook Vistan, and welcome to another episode of Keep the Flame Alive, the podcast for fans of the Olympics and Paralympics. I am your host, Jill Jarris, joined as always by my lovely co-host, Allison Brown. Allison, hello. How are you today? I was fine until a piece of my microphone just fell off. (laughs) Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. You know, but we're professionals, so we're just going to keep going. There you go. It's like your your skate comes untied, you know, something falls off. You just you just keep going. Right. Kind of I remember that race. This is years ago where this guy was doing downhill and he lost a pole and he just kept going. No. Oh, oh no. This, this is probably like 84, 88. And I didn't know how he didn't kill himself. So this is not as risky as downhill with one pole. So I think we'll be OK. Excellent. Well, we are less than two weeks away from the Olympics, which is incredible to think about. During the Olympics, and pretty much any time, you can text us at 208-352-6348. That's 208-FLAME-IT. So if you're not in our Facebook group, not on Twitter or not on Instagram, and and want to connect with us while you're watching, feel free to text us and we will text you back. All right. Today we are talking shooting with specialist Tim Sherry. Tim competes in men's 10 meter air rifle and three position rifle. He is part of the U.S. Army Marksmanship Unit and will be an alternate on Team USA for Tokyo 2020. We talked about how three position works and whether or not his feet fall asleep during training and competition. Take a listen. Small bore rifle, three position. What is this and what's the basic purpose or goal of a competition? Uh, so, so the goal of the competition is to get the highest possible score. You're using a, a 22 rifle, so it uses size 22 caliber long rifle cartridge, a uh, single shot, and we'll go through uh, three positions, 40 shots in each position. So it'll start with the kneeling position. So after you do 40 shots of that, you'll move to prone or laying down, do 40 shots there, and then move to standing up and do another 40 shots there. So you have a total of 120 shots. And each shot can count for uh, up to 10 points, so 0 to 10 points, for a grand total of 1,200 points if you shoot perfectly. The world record right now, I think, is an 1189, so 1,189 points. So he missed the 10 ring 11 times out of the 120 shots possible. And you're trying to, trying to get the highest score out of that. Okay. Uh, is this like air rifle in that the, the 10 ring is divided into millimeters too, or are we just dealing with one through 10 integers? For 22, it's mm-hmm. actually not like air rifles, but so it's, it's just integer for the uh, qualification part of it. Okay. Um, it's a little bit confusing. So in order to make the final of, of top eight, we do it all based off of integer scoring, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, nine, ten. And then they'll take the top eight based on that 120 shot qualification. And then we'll move on to do a 45 shot final. And we use the same target, but similar to air gun now, they'll do uh, decimal scoring. So the, the 10 ring is now divided up into decimal points. So we can do a 10.1, 10.0, 10.9 is, is the deepest shot that you can shoot in a final. Okay. And then in the 45 shot final, are you doing uh, 15 shots per position? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. So we'll do 15 shots and, and everything's based on time. So for the, you'll, you'll go five shot series in, in each position and you'll do three, three individual five shot series in kneeling. And then we'll change over to prone and do the same thing. And, and everyone's on the same time. So it, everyone knows, you know, right where we're at they'll call out scores in between each of those five shot series. So, you know, who's sitting in first, who's sitting in eighth um, to try to keep things competitive. Okay. How much time do you have to shoot? So the 
qualification side of it. So for the 120 shots, they'll give us two hours and 45 minutes. And it's just block time. You can use those two hours and 45 minutes however you choose. So you have some people that, that will shoot, you know, prone or kneeling a little bit quicker and take longer in standing or vice versa. For the final, everyone's on the same time. So they will call us to the line and give us five minutes of preparation and sighting time. So that gives us time to, to sight in our guns, uh, make sure that nothing's gone, you know, the sights haven't got bumped or anything like that uh, when we uh, walked over to the finals hall. And then once they call start, we'll have three minutes and 20 seconds for five shots in kneeling. We'll do that three times. And then they give us seven minutes to change our rifles over uh, from kneeling to prone. And during that change over time, we get uh, sighting shots again because most of us are changing our sights. So we get additional time to, to make sure our sights are, are on. And then we'll start in the, the five shot series for prone, which are fired in two minutes and 30 seconds. And then after our three prone series, we'll move on to a, another changeover period, which is nine minutes long to change over to standing. Uh, same thing. We can, we can get some sighting shots there. And then for the five shot series and standing, we are allotted four minutes and 10 seconds. And the, the target is the same size for each position, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So it's the same size. It's the same height. So it, it stays down there. I think it's, it's three quarters of a meter or something like that above the ground. And it, it's 50 meters away from you. So uh, it, it ends up being the same height. It, it doesn't look like it's really too high or too low if you're standing up or, or laying down since it's so far away. And how does the size of the small bore target compare to the target for air rifle? I think uh, so. So the, the size of the target, it's, it's 154 millimeters total. I know the 10 ring is 10 millimeters, which is about the size of the colored part of your eye or your, your pinky nail. And, and that's what we're shooting for every time. Compared to the air gun target, I think it's actually just scaled up. From a 10 meter target, if you just scaled it to, to be out 50 meters, I think it's the same size target. I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure on that. Okay, but that makes sense when when I think about it. It's insanely it small. Sense. Is is the short answer? <laughs> <laughs> but I know for sure that thing is is 10 millimeters, and, and that's that's kind of what we go off of. And, and yeah, like I said, it's, it's about the colored part of your eye that we're we're trying to hit every time. When you're going from position to position, I think this. It, this you kind of inferred because you get time to sight in between each round when you're kneeling versus lying down versus standing up. How do the sights differ or how does your aim differ? Does that make sense? It, it does. So we'll start with kneeling. We, uh, as a right-handed shooter, my left arm will be on the forehand of the gun and I'm wearing a sling in, in both kneeling and prone. Um, so that, that will help hold the gun up. So I'm not using muscle. And then my left elbow will be resting on my left knee. And then my right knee will be on the ground. So I'm, I have a one, one knee on the ground. I'm kneeling. And, and that kneel is pretty compact, right? Because you want to be as close to the ground as possible. It's not like your, your, your left leg is in a 90 degree angle, correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. My, um, I guess my left, the lower part of my left leg is a 90 degree angle to the ground. So, so it's pretty close into, uh, I, I guess kind of close into my butt. Um, okay. And then my, my right knee isn't, isn't spread out too far. I, I try to be pretty compact and, and pretty small. That's correct. Okay. D do your feet ever fall asleep? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So that's, I'm, I'm sitting on my right foot the whole time. And I'm, I'm usually in position for about 50 minutes for, for the, the qualification part. And yeah, my foot will fall asleep within probably know, 15 minutes of that. So it's asleep for majority of the time. Sorry, we're both kind of like moth open here. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to train yourself to not be distracted by that. Oh yeah, absolutely. That's, that's a big part of it for both prone and kneeling because we're also swinging our left hand up against the gun. So it's, it's kind of pinching it against the gun. So our left hand will also fall asleep in, in both prone and kneeling a lot of times. So it's a, there's a level of stamina, I guess, that you have to kind of build up to, to be comfortable being that uncomfortable for, for that period of time. What do you do to build up that stamina to say, hey, I'm okay, to, to, for right foot to go, I'm cool. I'm cool with falling asleep. Uh, I'm spent in the position uh, just by training it enough. I, I know some people, especially when you're younger, uh, some people go grab uh, the, the – 
roll that we will kneel on. So, so we sit, we have a roll underneath our right foot to kind of help prop us up. Um, and they'll sit in front of the TV, just sitting on that right foot to, to kind of get used to that right foot falling asleep. Um, we, we train enough. We spend enough time on the range that, that I don't need to go sit in front of the TV and do that. But it, a lot of it, it just comes from, from time spent in the position. And it, you start to notice that if I take a break um, after about a week or two, the first couple of times I come back after a break, you kind of notice that that stamina is gone. It, it's, I don't know if it's a muscle memory thing or just a, a brain thing that it, it hurts a little bit more the first few times you get back in after a break. Okay, now do we need to be concerned about we like I do this uh, long term nerve damage? Like, are, is there some long term injury from constantly having your hand or your foot fall asleep like that? I've never heard of anyone having an issue with that. Yeah, I, I, there's a lot of people that have shot prone for you know forty years or something like that, and I've never heard of anyone you know losing feeling in their fingers or anything like that. So I, I don't think it's a problem. I'll let you know if I get a little older and start to have any issues. <laughs> <laughs> when you stand up, does your, I mean, I would also wonder if your foot is trained to get the blood or in your brain is trained to get the blood right back fast too. I, I, that's not even making sense. I know, but like, <laughs> because you are an elite shooter and you have to deal with this, do you also recover faster when you get up or are, is everybody just kind of limping around for a couple minutes in their next preparation? Yeah, I think I think you end up limping around a little bit because we have that change over time. We're changing over our guns, so we're changing sights and butt and all that. And I, I guess I, I didn't quite get to that part of it, and, and I can talk more about that. But yeah, we we spend usually a handful of minutes changing over our guns and getting prepared for the next position. I think in that time, the blood flow comes back. Um, it might happen a little bit quicker just just because of how often we do it. Um, or maybe we just don't notice it and it, it, it isn't really a problem because it, it takes long enough for us to, to prepare for the next position, but it's not really anything that we have to take into account. Okay. Tim, just recognize right now, none of this conversation is going to go in a straight line. So just accept <laughs> that right off the bat. Well, that's good. I'm not good at, at you know, talking in a straight line. So <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So I just have one more question on this falling asleep because clearly Jill and I have totally had our minds blown by this. So let's say you're doing something else entirely like, you know, sitting and reading a book and your, your right hand falls asleep, you know, something that doesn't happen is related to shooting. Are you suddenly like, Oh, so that's why that feels like, like you don't even feel it in your right foot and your left hand anymore. And then when it happens to another part of your body, you realize what you do every day. I've never thought about that. Although I, you, you might, have kind of put this on my mind for the next time something falls I'm asleep. I'm so sorry. Like, you think about it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it really is kind of a fact of life for us. Like it's, it's so comfortable. I didn't even think about it. I, mean, I shot, I shot 40 shots of kneeling this morning and I, I didn't even consider that it was, it was odd or unusual that my foot was asleep when I stood back up. <laughs> okay. Now we've ruined his whole training. <laughs> Oh my God, what have we done? <laughs> All right. We're, I think we're done with limbs falling asleep. <laughs> back to what happened. Back to, back to the process before we so rudely interrupted. Oh, you're all good. So the, I guess with, with kneeling, the, the contact points will be my left hand on the fore end of the gun, my right hand on the grip, and, and that's what I pull the trigger with is my right hand. And then my face will, will touch the, what we call the cheek piece. Um, and so I'll, I'll kind of rest my head against the cheek piece so I don't have any tension in my neck. Um, and I'll be looking through the, the sight, both the rear sight and the front sight, with my right eye. And then there's a, a butt plate, uh, which is kind of custom adjusted for us for each position. And, and that'll be touched my right shoulder. And so on our rifles, they're heavily customizable and inter interchangeable or, or very easy to change over so that we can change them over from prone to standing to kneeling. So in between a changeover period, I move the, the contact point on my forend um, where my hand will go on the forend. There's a, there's a it's called a hand stop. So it's what I press my hand up against and that, that helps connect my swing. So I'll move that forward for prone. And then I'll change out both my cheek piece, my butt plate, and my sights. So really only the kind of the spine of the gun, 
of the stock stays the same and all of my contact points pretty much will, will change out along with the sites themselves so that I can, uh, I can get kind of a little bit different head position. So, so my head is a little bit higher up in kneeling and then a little bit lower down closer to the, the barrel itself in prone. Why is that optimal? Um, it just depends on, on kind of how your position is set up and, and the angles that your neck is in. So in prone, if you want, or if you were to leave uh, a little more gap between the barrel and your sights, uh, in prone, it, it's going to cause kind of a kink in your neck and it's really difficult to leave your neck like that for, uh, for 40 shots. Whereas in kneeling, you're sitting upright. So my, my back is kind of straight up. My, my torso is straight up. And so it kind of makes more sense for my neck to be straight up as well. And so it's a little bit easier to have a higher distance between my, my barrel and my sights uh, to kind of keep that, that angle with my neck. Okay. Now, is there an advantage to being taller or shorter as a shooter? That's a good question. I, I haven't found any advantage either way because we have a lot of people that are are tall and, and shoot well, especially there's a lot of, for the men, a lot of like lankier shooters. Um, but there's also plenty of, of shorter shooters um, that shoot very well. I think the biggest thing that needs to be taken into account is, is the way that the positions are set up. So for kneeling, my, the length of my leg, especially the, I guess, between my hip and my knee, uh, the length, that length really affects my whole position. So if I, I personally have really long legs and really long arms, so my position looks a lot different, especially more different than a lot of our shorter girls who have shorter legs and shorter arms um, compared to their torso lengths. So the, you can shoot really well if you're shorter or taller, but you can't necessarily shoot in the same positions um, as, as a taller person if you were a shorter person. But if you could not fold your body into the optimal position, that's that means you won't be a good shoot as good of a shooter, correct? I, that's correct. But okay. I think most people. I, I haven't really seen any people. I mean, even coaching uh, kind of junior shooters or, or novice shooters. You know, first getting them into position, everyone can get into some semblance of a good position. It's not necessarily the exact same position that I use. Uh, but like I said, there's there's a lot of different body types. And so there's, there's a, several different types of positions that you can use and, and still achieve um, similar results. It just depends on, on how your body is shaped and, and how flexible you are in some cases. So as you're growing up, do you have, you have to adjust to different heights as you grow and have growth spurts, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. That was uh, a really difficult thing. I, I started when I was about 12 years old. So every time I felt like I got a good, you know, a good position or a good understanding of what I was trying to do, um, you know, with my gun and my adjustments on my gun, I had a growth spurt and everything changed. And, and I basically had to start over again. Hello, puberty. Yeah, I know. That's so frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you're not a short kid. So it's sort of like it would come probably in big stretches. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It was like an intro to it at time. <laughs> I think it's worth saying, I think that's why a lot of the elite shooters are a little bit older than, than most other Olympic athletes. Like we're not, you know, like female gymnasts are, are 16 and stuff like that. Most of our elite shooters are, I, I think in their thirties, maybe early thirties before their eyes start deteriorating, but it, it gives you time to find the adjustments that you need and, and actually hone the technical side of the positions um, after, you know, all the growth spurts have finished and everything like that. That's really you interesting. you got to stop growing to be a good <laughs> yeah. shooter. Yeah, there's that, that sweet spot. Stop growing, still not need bifocals. Stop growing and then also kind of master the, the mental side of things, um, whereas it's very similar to golf. And I, I think – Similar to that, you have some, some older older golfers. You also have older shooters where they're able to, to keep their bodies going for a little bit longer, and, and they've got the, the mental and physical mastered so that they can stay competitive with, with some of the younger competitors. Let's look, let's look at standing. Okay, so standing is going to be uh, virtually identical to air rifle. 
you've already talked to, to Ginny about that. The, the difference really at this point is, is just the gun. So um, we're shooting a 22 as opposed to a, you know, 0.177 caliber air rifle. So you're going to have a little bit more weight. The, the gun can be up to 17 and a half pounds. So it's, it's about five pounds heavier than an air rifle. And there will be recoil with a 22 as opposed to with an air rifle. So for most shooters, the positions are set up very similarly, although some people will, will change their position for 22 to help handle the recoil a little bit. But in terms of, the, I guess, the mechanics of the position, we don't have any sling. So, so the only time we can use a sling is in kneeling and prone. So standing, it's all, I guess, it's kind of a free position. You're just using uh, muscle tension and bone support to hold you and the gun up. And for a right-handed shooter, uh, the, I guess the best way I can explain it is we, we will kind of kick our left hip towards the target. So we're standing, my chest is facing, not facing towards the target, I guess. So I'm, I'm turned to the right of the target. So my, my left hip is, is pointing at the target, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. It's like, and I'm gonna kick my, Allison, it's like biathlon. So yeah, your, your exactly. target like, is it. Yeah, you, now you're on mute there. I, I'm moving my body as he's speaking so I can get the... <laughs> You can't see me doing this, Tim, but I don't shoot. So this is sort of like me physically trying to get this. So okay, just shoot my so she knows what you're talking about. So, so my left hip is facing towards the target, and I'm going to kick it forward towards the target. So most of my weight will be on my left foot. It, it'll be about 70% of my weight on my left foot and 30% on my right foot. Um, and so what that does is that kind of gives me a shelf with my left hip to rest my left elbow on. And so that, that allows me to use bone support and then my, my gun will be sitting on my left hand. And so hopefully, ideally, um, I'll be using bone support going all the way down through the left arm, through my left hip and my left leg, uh, mostly bone support, supporting the weight of the rifle and, and most of my own weight. So how strong is the recoil? How much is that kick? It's pretty minimal. It's a 22. I, I don't, I don't really know what to compare it to, but it's, it's, Pretty much the the that I can think of one of the smallest calibers that is you know commercially available to shoot. It's a it's a very small recoil. It doesn't it doesn't hurt. It, it's not it's not going to bruise you or anything like that. Um, the biggest concern for us is that the recoil can uh, I guess it can kind of break down the position over forty shots. So if your if your position is set up poorly, and, and there's a whole lot of reasons why it could be set up poorly, but it, it won't come back consistently every time because of the recoil. Um, so so it, it basically the recoil just kind of, it seeks out any imperfections in your position and, and can make them or can kind of amplify them throughout the course of a 40 shot match. Yeah, maybe Allison, maybe it's like, you know how somebody just maybe puts in, punch in the shoulder a little bit that, hey buddy, they don't do yeah, that. Yeah, I, I think it's, <laughs> and I mean, it, it, it's pretty small, but it, it, yeah, I mean, it's noticeable. You're going to see it. But yeah, it's a, a pretty light, yeah, so then is the challenge trying to get back, you know, you, you set up and you're in that ultimate, ultimate position. You shoot, you have recoil that's going to push you out. So it's always trying to get back to that position. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's kind of the name of the game. Is It's just consistency, and it's trying to do the same thing over and over again for 40 shots in, in both or, or in each kneeling prone and standing. And, and there's a whole lot of stuff that can compromise the position over those 40 shots. You know, like we talked about hands and feet falling asleep. Um, we're relying on some muscle tension. So your muscles can fatigue or, or even stretch out with the way my position is set up. Sometimes my hip flexors will kind of stretch out and cause my, my hips to start to turn and do weird things in standing. And, and the recoil can add to that as well. Uh, just, just making it difficult to find uh, that consistent position again every single time the exact same way for 40, 40 shots consecutively. What about weather factors? How does wind, we'll start with the wind because that's a noticeable one because they always have wind flags. So what yep. happens if the if we go through kind of directions, how, how do they affect your shot and how do they affect how you sight? So if the flags are blowing toward you, what does that do? What, what do you have to do to compensate for that? Or do you? So, so if the flags are blowing toward me, it'll, it'll, put the, the bullet lower than my intended, you know, than a no wind situation. So it'll drop the bullet down. And the, the counter to that is if, if the wind is coming from behind me, it'll, it'll raise the bullet up. So it'll go a little bit higher. 
And then what if they're blowing left or right? Left or, you know, if it's blowing from the left, it caused the bullet to go right and actually a little bit down. Um, so okay. it's actually kind of sitting at, if you're looking at the hands of the clock, it'll be at about four o'clock if it was blowing from the left. And then if it was blowing from the right, it'll be uh, to the left and a little bit up. So it'll be at about 10 o'clock on a clock. So when you take the wind factor into effect, I mean, you're still shooting at a very, very tiny space. So what, like, do you just try to adjust your gun a millimeter or two to, or, you know, how you hold it to account for the wind? So actually our, the sites that we use, although they're open, not using a scope or anything like that, but the site itself has adjustment knobs on it. So I can, I can correct left, right, up and down with, with the knobs on my site to compensate for, um, you know, if I, if I had pumped my sights, but also if, if there's wind blowing or any other conditions, I can, I can try to compensate for, for those conditions with my sights. Okay. So and that's that, usually a way of, of adjusting for any environmental conditions is, is to try to try to correct with my sights or better yet, um, hopefully just wait for one condition to come back. So that, that's another I guess, kind of tactic that you could use is just waiting. So picking one condition, you know, I say I want to shoot in, with the wind blowing from left to right. So that means ideally I will only shoot if the wind is blowing from left to right. If it, if it turns around and starts blowing at me or blowing from right to left, I'll just stop and wait. And that's, that's kind of the, the benefit of having that two hours and 45 minute block time for qualification is I can sit there and wait for say five minutes and, and wait for my condition, my wind condition to come back. And then I have to shoot a little bit quicker but I can, I can shoot without, you know, kind of gambling that my, my guess is right on, on my side adjustments. Okay. Will they ever call a match because of weather, like pouring rain or other conditions? I think about the only time that they'll call a match for weather is, is with thunder and lightning. I, I, I've shot in rain plenty of times, a lot of times, especially for these international competitions, we have a, a cover over our heads. We don't necessarily get rained on unless the wind is really blowing pretty hard and it'll it'll blow the, the rain sideways at you. But yeah, even if that's the case, they're not too bothered by it. The the match officials, I guess, as long as we won't get struck with lightning, they'll keep the match going. Yeah, they're not bothered. They're not trying to be out there hitting this, you know, <laughs> minuscule target. Yeah, and, and I mean, some of the times the the wind is bad enough it, it blows our body, especially in standing. Um, cause you're kind of, you're standing sideways. A lot of times, uh, the wind will be blowing left or right. So it'll be blowing right at the cross section of your body. There's been times where it feels like I'm going to get blown over. Luckily it hasn't happened yet, but yeah, if the wind is strong enough, it'll, it'll blow us back and forth. Our, our bodies actually will, will be blown back and forth, um, which makes it pretty hard to hit, you know, the size of your pinky nail target 50 meters away. <laughs> when I was watching some video and when you load, because you have to load each bullet individually, correct? Correct. Yeah, it's a single shot. Okay. But when I was watching this, I noticed you don't usually move your face away from the gun. And you do everything yeah. kind of by feel. Why is that? That kind of goes back to the repeatability thing that I was just talking about. The fewer things that you move away from the gun, the fewer things you have to put back in the same spot. So especially... Personally, for, for prone and kneeling, it, it's easier for me just to leave my face on the gun. and I, I just know where my bullets are, and I know where the loading port for my rifle is. And it, it's really easy for me just to pick up a bullet, put it in the loading port, and close the bolt without really looking at anything. Um, and that's just one less thing that I have to put back. If I were to pick up my head at the time, I'd have to put it back in the exact same place every time. And if I didn't, that could cause some changes in you know the angle that I'm looking through the site or pressure on the gun, or muscle tension in my shoulder or neck. It, it's just another variable that, that I'm able to take out and, and hopefully not have to worry about quite as often. It's kind of meditative in a way. It, it feels like, like when you watch it, it's very meditative. It Does it feel that way too? Sometimes. It depends on how easy it's going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it, it is, it's very repetitive. I mean, it, it's slow. Um, and methodical and can take, you know, for standing, we have over a shot of minute uh, it, it, during qualification a lot of times, as long as you use your time right. Um, so it can be really meditative and, you know, meditation practice actually helps helps me quite a bit, kind of train my mind to get ready for shooting. 
but yeah, there are other times where it's, it kind of feels like the exact opposite where it's, it's very frustrating because things aren't going well, or, or even like I was saying with the wind, you know, you sit there and you wait for your wind for five minutes and then all of a sudden your condition is here and you have to, you have to shoot really quickly because you don't know how long that, that wind condition will be there. So sometimes it's meditative. Sometimes it's, uh, you have to use kind of situational awareness and be really, really smart with, with how you're going to work with anything that arises, whether it's muscle tension or fatigue or heart rate racing or wind conditions and weather conditions going on outside of your body. Okay. So I want to ask a little bit about your relationship with your gun. Okay. Do you, which sounded really creepy and sounded less (laughs) creepy in my head. Do you think of, do you anthropomorphize your gun? Do you give it a name? Do you think of it as a teammate or is it more of a tool? For me, it's more of a tool. I've gone through, like I said, I've been shooting since I was 12 years old. So I've gone through a a lot of different types of guns and uh, uh, different equipment, you know, like I was talking about with the cheek pieces and butt plates and stuff like that. Because it's all interchangeable, I I change it out often or make changes to it often. So, yeah, a lot of times I just see it as a tool, and and it's a very important tool to helping me perform the way I want to. But uh, in, in my mind, it's just kind of a means to an end, I guess. What what type of gun do you have? The the rifle that I shoot is a it's a Bliker. It's made in Switzerland, and our uh, we have gunsmiths here. I, I shoot with the Army Marksmanship Unit, and we have gunsmiths that actually place that barreled action. So it, it's just a it, it's the actual gun portion, but they were able to put that into a different stock. So it, a, it's a German manufactured stock uh, made by Onshoots. And it's just, it's a stock that I've shot for longer and I'm more comfortable with. So I have a, a better performing action and, and barrel put into a, a stock that I'm a little bit more comfortable with. I'm sorry. I immediately was thinking, oh, I hope that Swiss barrel speaks German and isn't a <laughs> French speaking Swiss piece. But luckily, our, our gunsmiths are, are very good at, at helping them speak the same language, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I warned you about a straight line, Tim. <laughs> No, I'm just it's so fascinating how different gun parts can come apart and come together. Because yeah, I have a 22 because my husband and I did some uh, summer biathlon, and I think I have like a Savage. I oh, did it cheap, so I have a Savage stock. But then somebody has biathlon. No, I'm sorry, Savage Action with a a homegrown stock. So it's a little it's a little Frankenstein-y, I guess you could say. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I, I was actually going to use that same adjective for, for my rifle, too. I, probably a little more expensive than yours, but it still yep. feels really tiny where you're, you're putting a, a barreled action that was never meant to go in this stock into this stock, um, and you're making it work, and it, it works very well. Uh, it just takes a little bit of finagling. Now, I'm glad you brought up price because I like the money side of this stuff. We know, <laughs> that, we know that shooting is a very expensive sport on the whole. Yeah. What what are we talking about with how much your rifle costs? Uh, so the Bliker rifle, if you bought it in the stock, would cost close to $10,000. And then I, I think if you were to buy just the barrel to action separate, I think that's about 5000 And then for the on-shoot stock that I use, that's another 4000 So, yeah, I, I guess in, in the grand scheme of things, we're about at 10000 before you start adding in gunsmithing and all the extra accessories that go on it. So being in the U.S. Army Marksmanship Program is very helpful because you have access to the gunsmith and things like that? Absolutely, yeah. So they, they have provided me not only the gunsmith, but also the, the action and the stock. So it, it's their gun that I'm using. And, and then on top of that, uh, I, I mentioned barreled action. One important part of that is the barrel itself. And that's what the, the bullet spends most of its time in. So we will actually change out barrels. And, and test different barrels and different lots of ammo to try to find the best combination that shoots the tightest possible groups off of a bench. And that should help me shoot the tightest possible groups out of my position. It's very scientific, all of this testing. Yes, absolutely. It, it's scientific and it, it's also time consuming. I mean, it, it takes a lot of time away from training. And, and that's kind of where I see my, my rifle as a, as a tool that, requires a lot of attention because I need to take a lot of time to make it shoot on par with my competitors around the world 
before I can even start focusing on making myself shoot on par with my competitors around the world. Uh, so it's, it's a constant balancing act of, you know, how much time do I need to spend testing my rifle and working with the gunsmith to, to make it work the best it can for me. And then working on myself and my own technique to, to perform as well as I possibly can. And how much ammunition would you go through in a training session? Each day I go through 100 to 200 rounds and I'll do that six days a week. That's without testing ammunition. Uh, a normal testing session will take probably close to a thousand rounds just to go through every different lot of am- ammunition that we have available to us and, and see uh, what batch or what lot shoots best in that given barrel. Wow. When you're in competition, do you, does the competition provide the ammo or are you providing the ammo? We provide our own ammo. Okay. So it just has to be uh, commercially produced ammunition. Uh, so there's no, you know, home, home, home reloaded 22 or anything like that. It has to be commercially produced. But we, we will purchase our own ammo, and that's that's preferred for us because we, we spend so much time finding the right the right lots of ammo and the right manufacturers of ammunition too um, that match our our rifles. The complexity of the sport just has blown me away. It just we when talking with Jenny, we also talked with McKenna Gear, and just the, so it's so complex, it's amazing. Yeah, um, it really is crazy. I mean, and that's. Just that's just the barrel of action and and the stock side of it. I mean, it it, it extends beyond that. You know, I, I can buy different butt plates and different cheek pieces because those are interchangeable. Like I said, just based on what I want, and those those are usually like three or four hundred dollars as well each, and and they're completely adjustable too. So I can I can adjust them left, right, up and down, side to side, all all these different adjustments to make them fit me exactly perfectly. And then we go into the, the shooting suit, which is also very complex and, and very adjustable, too. So do you ever feel like Batman? No, I've never felt like that. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever I, felt like Woody from Toy Story? <laughs> yeah, I think that's probably more accurate. Our, our shooting are so stiff. You're kind of waddling around like a penguin most of the time. You don't feel cool wearing it. <laughs> <laughs> How does the team event work is it just you guys get together and everyone does it combines their scores or how, how does it work? So they just came out with it. I've, I've actually only shot it once. We just shot that the, the last world cup in India. I would expect it'll probably keep changing um, just based on, on their, you know, kind of interpretation of how it went this last time. Well, so for the, I, I guess we have two different team events. We have a men's, uh, a men's team event. So that'll be three men. We'll stand online next to each other and shoot the team event. And then there's also a mixed team event. And I, I shot that with Jenny over in, in India. And so I have a, a male and a female from the same country. We'll shoot together. And the way you get into the final is a little bit different with each of those. For the, for the men's team event, they take our qualification scores. So the same score that we use for our individual qualification to get into the individual final, they'll use that. And so they'll just take all three shooters from the USA and combine them together, add them up and compare them to every other country. And they take the top eight, I believe, and move them on to a semifinal. Uh, whereas for the mixed team, Ginny and I had to shoot a, a mixed team qualification event and then move on from there into a, a, a semifinal and then again into a final after that. Oh, that's interesting. Is, is the about the amount you're shooting and the time it takes the same for the two rounds versus the three rounds? The the semifinal and the final are, are, are more similar to our our three position individual final. So it's like forty five shots, or I think we do like thirty shots in the middle there for, for the the quarter final or the semifinal. Sorry. So it, it's a it's a smaller number of shots and it's very intense that that small number of shots. So it, it, I guess it takes a little bit different skill set or, or different mindset um, to go into those because you're you kind of feel a little bit rushed and and you also are very aware that every shot matters at this point. It's probably going to be decided by a point or two. So you're, you really don't want to mess up is is basically the the best way to say it. Interesting. But I bet that's kind of exciting to watch. Yeah, hopefully I, I actually really haven't got to watch it a whole lot. I've just shot it once, but I I think because it's a little bit shorter period of time, it it should be a little bit more exciting to watch and, and a little more head to head, especially for the final for the, I guess both the mixed team and the, uh, 
individual or, or not individual, but same gender team final. Um, it, it's head to head competition. So each country will pick who they want to shoot in a position. So for the mixed team, it's kneeling and standing. They kind of get rid of prone. So for that, uh, we made the, I guess the bronze medal match Ginny and I did in India. So I shot kneeling head to head against India's kneeling shooter, which happened to be a girl and Ginny shot standing. So, so we chose that I would shoot kneeling and Ginny would shoot standing and we were competing against India and they kind of chose the opposite. Their, their female shot kneeling and their male shot standing. But the way it works is it just goes shot to shot and it's head to head. So I just have to beat India's kneeling shooter to get a point for USA. And, and the same for Jenny. She just has to be India's standing shooter, and she would, she would get a point for us. And they, they set a, a point total. I, I, I don't recall what the point total was for the mixed team, but it, the first country to reach that a given point total wins, wins that medal, whatever medal round you're in. Oh, that's very cool. I like, that sounds like a fun format. It, it was really fun to shoot. It was really cool. And then we did the same thing. The, the same gender team runs very similar. It's just that you have three shooters, so now you're shooting – prone standing and kneeling you get all three yeah it was a really fun format it was it was cool and and unique i think what kind of superstitions or things must you absolutely do on competition day i get asked this a lot and i, I really don't have any superstitions i think it's um there's there are certain things that i like to do to help me perform well but there's no like i need to tie my left boot first or wear these lucky green socks or anything like that um, it, it's just certain things that I found that helped me perform well. So, um, we talked about shooting being really meditative. I, I like to do, you know, about five minutes of meditation before at some point in the morning before I shoot, um, just to kind of balance me out and, and I guess help me understand where, where I'm at mentally that day and, and kind of prepare. And then other than that, it's a lot of really specific shooting warm up stuff. So I'll do some balance warm ups and uh, holding in my positions just to try to understand uh, how tight how tight certain muscles are that day or how the position feels and just kind of get a feel for the position before we start actually shooting record shots. Shooting's not known as a big spectator sport necessarily. What's it <laughs> no. like when you have spectators versus no spectators? Um, I think it's really exciting having spectators. I, I know some some people kind of freak out because it is – new it doesn't always happen but I, I like being able to share my sport with other people and uh, I, I kind of feed off of other people's energy whether it's a, a teammate so I, that's another reason why I like these new team events but also the spectators uh, some of the more memorable matches I've had are, are having more spectators in the stands or you know having my family around in the stands being able to watch my competitions so I, I definitely feed off the spectators a little bit. And then as, as the energy increases in these finals, sometimes we get a lot more clapping and noise. It gets pretty exciting. And I, I think it's, it, I think it's the, the way forward for our sport. And, and I really enjoy having the, the spectators around to, to watch what we do. Okay. Bizarre travel story with your gun. What have your issues been? Well, I guess it, it, it always just, it, it takes forever in airports. So it doesn't matter where you go, whether it's in the U.S. or internationally. Um, we can fly with our rifles. Obviously, that's how we get there. But uh, we have to go through all these different approvals. Um, in the U.S., TSA will, will look at our guns. We have to declare them, and they run them through extra scanners, and um, we sign an extra piece of paper that says, you know, our firearm is unloaded and stuff like that. If we go into international uh, or, or any other countries, a lot of the times we have to provide – our gun information before we even get there to get these kind of clearances to come into the country with our, our rifles. So whether we're getting into the country or leaving the country, usually it takes quite a bit longer for them to check the clearances. And uh, not this last time we were in India, but the time before it took so long to go through those clearances. We, we missed our flight and we ended up staying in India another like five days. I think it was, there was some other, other, political stuff going on in India that kind of kept us from getting another flight. But what led us to missing our flight was just taking forever getting clearances for our guns and our ammo. And, and that's, that's kind of par for the course. Like it, it usually takes several hours in an airport just to, just to clear our guns through customs or through to DSA. Wow. So always pack extra socks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We, we have a, uh, our carry on bag always has extra at least a, a change of clothes in case we get stuck in an airport or hopefully a hotel. But yeah, if we get stuck in a country with our checked bags, 
already in the U.S., we, we prefer to have, you know, some toiletries and some extra clothes just in case. Does the rifle get checked or are you allowed, because it's unloaded, are you allowed to bring it on board? Because it's... Uh, we can, yeah, so it has to get checked. That's, that's okay. part of the process. So. Okay. To check the bag and then they double check it just to make sure that it is unloaded and there's there's nothing, I guess, uh, out of the ordinary or out of their rules uh, for, for them to be able to check it and put it on the plane. How nerve wracking is it to hope that it comes off the plane? Um, it can be uh, pretty nerve wracking. I think that's, that's probably the, the biggest concern is is not having your rifle or your equipment when you get there. So usually we travel with a rifle case and an equipment bag. So that's, that's two pieces of, of luggage that I have to hope that the, uh, the airline didn't misplace on the flight over or, or you know, on the tarmac and, and getting onto the, the little carousel that it comes out on. I, I don't think I've actually ever had a problem with that, but I know plenty of teammates that have. So for, uh, for, for important competitions, a lot of the times we actually uh, kind of, I will bring my, one of my teammates' rifles and one of my rifles in my rifle case and my teammate will bring one of their rifles and one of my rifles in their case. So that way we kind of have a backup in case my, my gun case goes missing. Um, at least then I have, I have some rifle to shoot and, and still be able to compete and be competitive at the whatever competition is that we, we just traveled to. It's so complicated. Yeah, very complicated. Things you don't think about when, when you're just watching the Olympics on TV. Yeah, I, I think the travel, I would assume for probably most sports, the, the travel is something that, that you don't even think about or don't even consider. I, I've always thought about, I guess, just being in a sport, you know, like pole vaulters and stuff like that. I, I have no clue how they even manage to, to travel with their stuff. <laughs> hey, let's, let's tell you about canoes and kayaks. That's, that's... <laughs> yeah, there are some days that I wish I was a runner and I could just travel with, a you know, a pair of clothes and a, a pair of shoes and, and be ready to go for my event. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tim. You can follow Tim on Insta, Twitter, and Facebook at Sherry Tim USA. We will have links to all of those in the show notes. Uh, before we move on to our Shooklistan update, we would like to give a shout out to all of our Patreon patrons. They help keep us financially afloat as there is a lot of money and time that goes into producing this podcast. If you are able to and would like to help us out, we would greatly appreciate it. You can find out more at patreon.com slash flame alive pod. Welcome to Shukflistan. Yes, it is time to check in with our past guests who are members of our team Keep the Flame Alive. What do you got, Allison? Parachuter McKenna Gear has been selected for Team USA and will be heading to Tokyo. Woo-woo. I am getting really excited for the Paralympics this I year. I agree. And there's going to be a lot more coverage. Yes, which is so going to we'll make it good. Make it a little easier to be excited when you can actually see things. <laughs> A decathlete, Jordan Gray, is featured in a New York Times story about female decathletes and their quest to get the event in the Olympics. We will have a link to that in the show notes. Equestrians Philip Dutton and Sydney Collier are on their way to Tokyo with a stop off in Aachen first. And Luca Jones, Stephanie Robel and Maggie Shea have arrived in Tokyo and are doing their various quarantining and examining of facilities. So that's been exciting to see. And Beach volleyball player Kelly Clace will take off in a week. So exciting. All the arrivals, all the Australian uh, athletes got all their kit. So they got the suitcases. So they've all been posting about that. Um, so, yeah, it's really getting serious. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm very a lot of time here. <laughs> and uh, I, I, tying in with our, our last team update, I'm very curious as to how they've, they're adjusting to the new time zone and how long it's taking them to adjust to the new time zone because our sleep study specialist, Renska Locke, received her doctorate from the University of Groningen. So congratulations to Renska. We got some bad news from Tokyo. <sighs> we did get some bad news from Tokyo. The the prefecture is under a state of emergency until August 22, and that means that the government has said no fans will be allowed to watch any of the games, and that has been expanded to include baseball, softball, and football venues outside of Tokyo, 
Uh, public is urged not to go and watch the marathon or race walks up in Sapporo and uh, or go and watch the road cycling, which is happening around Mount Fuji. <sighs> it's frustrating. I was very angry last week when I got this news. But not surprised. Not surprised. You know, I, I was chatting a little bit with Rory Tomizawa about this, and he said, you know, basically, there's enough people who don't like the Olympics and general dissatisfaction, you know, worrisome about outsiders coming in and visitors from all over the place, and that's going to create this surge. So it's not surprising given that Tokyo's COVID numbers were going up, but it is disappointing that it got to this point. It will be a unique experience, both for viewers at home and for the athletes. Right. And it will be difficult for everybody involved. Never mind the monetary (laughs) ramifications of this. I mean, I don't even want to think about that. But for us watching at home, well, well, I'm sure during the games, we'll be talking a lot about what the experience is like. And this will be interesting when they, when, our Shuk Flistanis come home and we get to chat with them. Was it worth having them without spectators? Good question. Because many of them have competed without spectators to begin with. Some of them have been to Olympics before. Some of them haven't been to Olympics before. So what is that all going to be like when you have a different expectation of what this magnanimous event is? I mean, one of the things that we love so much about the Olympics is the world comes together for this one event, you know, the greatest sporting event in the world kind Mm -hmm. of thing. And the world isn't coming together. One of the things that we talked about months ago was this would be a sign of hope that we're moving past the pandemic. And it feels like a sign of despair in a way saying we're not moving past the pandemic. Mm. And you know, with any, and I don't want to say luck because it's not luck. It's actually an incredible amount of hard work. Beijing will be that, but Beijing won't be that for other reasons. Mm-hmm. You're right. So are we really looking at Paris now to be that? But that's years away. So this is... Years I'm away, worried. but we also don't know how long this pandemic is going to last. Right. So is having Tokyo more damaging to the Olympic movement than canceling it outright? That's an excellent question, because then what do you, you know, how, and you'll only know this after it's happened. Right. And maybe 10 years from now. Mm-hmm. But in a funny way, wouldn't that put Los Angeles back in the same position that it was in 84? <laughs> Right. Because the Olympic movement had been so damaged by the boycott, had been so damaged by the financial scandals of Montreal. And here comes L.A. Right. That reinvigorated the movement. And of course, I'm skipping a couple there. But, you know, would L.A. then again be that again, another turning point? To the Olympic movement, which is always very interesting because, you know, we all know that America gets on the outs with the Olympic movement just in general. I mean, right. You know, we are we we understand America's it's very it's very interesting how we're a powerhouse and and all of these things, but then we also do stuff that is not very diplomatic. And so it doesn't make for great relations sometimes. But LA has always been there at some kind of pivotal point. Like you know, during, <laughs> you know, even th- uh, uh 32 when you've got this depression oh LA still happened right and then 84 LA still happened so 28 LA still gonna happen and where are we in the Olympic movement it'll be a very interesting time to be studying the Olympics yeah I'm very curious what historians are thinking about right now and what they're looking at right now to see okay these are the kind of things I'd, I'd like to know about as they happen. But, you know, you only get uh, time is a very important part of being a historian because you need that reflection and you need to see what happens afterward. I mean, like you say, this is now a bigger financial debacle for Japan than it was in the past because we we knew these were games were really, really expensive because it's the last of the mega building blitzes. But 
now the government has taken away a big source of revenue. Right, because when we talked to uh, Ken Hanscom, he was saying this was the uh, most subscribed Olympics. They were getting the most requests for tickets, the Mm -hmm. most requests for press passes, and everything was selling out and all the hotels were already booked. So they were counting on literally a million people coming into the country and all that yen so that they were going to make up a lot of this money just because there was going to be such a an influx of people. And now not only is there nobody coming, you can't even have spending within the country. Right. Because I'm sure that whatever the maximum was going to be for a venue, I would bet that there would be enough people within the country to sell out those tickets. I agree. It's interesting because there is still pro baseball and pro soccer other professional sports are going on with spectators in the stands it's just that the olympics has this big kind of stigma attached to it almost and just the assumption that it's going to be people from everywhere and therefore nobody can go and now you're also going to have the glut of memorabilia because not only do they already produce all the things they were ready for 2020. You had all the mascots and all the t-shirts. Now, even within Japan, as you said, there's a stigma. Mm -hmm. So they're not even going to get sold. So are we going to have this huge influx into the United States of all the mascots and then nobody's going to want them? And in the future, will Tokyo 2020 slash 2021 memorabilia be more valuable because people didn't want to buy it because of all the stigma surrounding? That's a good question, too. And I kind of wonder if it is uh, dependent on what the memorabilia is. So Um, is this going to be Beanie Babies in the 90s or Beanie Babies in the 2000s? Good question. It will definitely be interesting to see what happens. And we don't know what's going to happen. Are, Are suddenly local people going to get excited for the games when they start seeing the competition, especially some of the the sports that uh, Japan is really strong in, then will they go out and buy gear and things like that? I don't know. It'll be really, really interesting. And then how, as an organizing committee, do you drum up excitement about this? (sighs) So I don't know. But what we're going to hear and what I don't want to hear is in like six months when they're like, oh my gosh, these games were so expensive. Well, you cut off your revenue source. Right, because they were expensive, like you said, expensive to begin with, expensive to postpone, and expensive to have no fans there. Right, right. And you kind of want to go, come on, TBOC, IOC, just slip them a little check. You know, they, they really have bent over backwards to make your event happen. And we all know IOC is really good about not taking responsibility for a lot of stuff. But do them a solid. Slip on the line. You, know, you got seven figures, eight figures sitting around somewhere. Maybe even nine. I can't count that high. <laughs> Just ten, ten. Take a billion off. Come on. Use it with all the energy savings you're, you're getting from Olympic House. <laughs> uh, anyway, so uh, the not so fun part about how to handle the COVID situation is that a lot of weird stuff is going on. So the Kyoto news reported that the Osaka XL hotel, Tokyo and central Tokyo tried to celebrate, separate the elevator usage. So they did that by putting a Japanese only sign on one set of elevators and foreigners only sign on the other set of elevators. Oh, So that was tough. And apparently some of the Japanese were like, well, can we take the foreigner elevators anyway? So they got a little criticism. Chinese officials were also upset. Their sailing team is in a hotel and the officials said, yeah, we're separated by floors from other guests. However, everybody's mingling in the the lobby in the restaurant anyway. So what's the point? So you're going to have that. I mean, people are still traveling in Japan and there's no way to really keep some of these athletes separate because they're having satellite villages closer to venues that are far away from Tokyo. Do you remember 
there was an issue where South Korea was protesting the look of one of the symbols because it looked like the imperial Japanese flag. Oh, right, right. Yes. So a couple, this was, you know, yeah, a couple of years going ago. back years. Yeah. You know, this was early 2018, 2019, when we lived in a different world. But we need to remember the historical context of Japan in greater Asia. Mm-hmm. That those memories are still with those countries. And if you start isolating and saying Japanese only and foreigners only, U.S. would have the same problem. You yes. know, if we did things like that. You know, the xenophobia is still there. And we're already having all these issues around the Olympics. And I keep saying this, please don't be stupid. And yet people keep being stupid. But yeah, you have to be extraordinarily sensitive and careful and ask lots of people before you do any of these things. Mm -hmm. Because as simple as, yes, we should have separate elevators. Like I remember I had to go into the hospital during COVID. And if you were an inpatient versus going to the outpatient, you literally were in different wings of the hospital and, and different elevators. Made perfect sense. But in a hotel that's catering to travelers, having two different elevators separated by race, ethnicity, or nationality, yikes, is the right. only thing I can think to say. Right, right. I wonder if the organizing committee is going, we only have so many days left of this. Well, I posted on our Facebook page a video of one of the Tokyo officials announcing how there's not going to be spectators. And, you know, in this very Japanese way, he apologizes multiple times and, and says he's sorry. And he gets choked up. Aww. And I think it's also he's upset and disappointed. But the stress of this, I can't even imagine the pressure that they're under. <sighs> but hey, t -Buck arrived. Safely. Yes, he's quarantining. That's all we really know at this point. Um, I'm not sure. He had made plans to go to different parts of the country. I don't know if he's going to end up going because there's not a lot of support for that in the country. Um, but he's there. We're going to have an IOC session soon. So the whole IOC family will be together again in person instead of on Zoom. That'll be fun and interesting. And Good chance to pass the hat. <clears throat> yeah, <Tokyo>. right. <laughs> Flip the waiters an envelope at the end of the of the wedding. Right. Right. So and then uh, we noticed when Kelly Clace announced it on Instagram when she was she's got a week before she travels. Rule 40 is going to an effect soon. So you are probably seeing a blitz of sponsor thanking right now because athletes will be under embargo for a while. But do you know where Rule 40 does not go into effect? Where? On our podcast. So if anyone is interested in sponsoring our everyday Tokyo coverage, you can send us an email at flamealivepod at gmail.com. And that's going to do it for this week. Do we have IOC? Wait, no. I have something very important to share before we go. Oh. I found my Team USA Oreos. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they were at my stop and shop this week. There was a whole display. Nope. There was no Ted Ligety. There was no people yet. It was just a rack. And your Oreos? I haven't tried them yet. Okay. I was going to ask. You know what I haven't seen and it's really disappointing is any Coke stuff. Good point. Like Coke did summer and they've had, they've had logos on just like, oh, hey, we, we are an Olympic and Paralympic supporter, but there's no like promotion or anything. I wonder if they were just like, well, we don't know if it's going to happen, so we're not going to do anything. And I wonder if some of the sponsors are hesitant because there's been so much backlash. That could be, but I, I don't know. I mean, you had this event anyway that you're spending money on. Right. I don't know. It's a very good question. And I, I'd be curious to know if other countries are seeing things yet. I mean, obviously, the U.S. does more than anybody else with these kind of product placements. Mm -hmm. But I'd be curious to see because we talked about the Cheerios in Canada. Mm -hmm. And I know there are other sponsors around the world. So I'm wondering if people are seeing things in their grocery stores. Yeah, let us know if you do. That will do it for this episode. Let us know if you will be tuning in to shooting during Tokyo 2020. 
Email us at flamealivepod at gmail.com. Call or text us at 208-352-6348. That's 208-FLAME-IT. We're Flame Alive Pod on Twitter and Insta and keep the Flame Alive podcast group on Facebook. Join us on Thursday for our interview with Greco-Roman wrestler Alejandro Sancho as we go out to music by Mercury Sunset. Thank you so much for listening and until next time, keep the flame alive. Now, do we need to be concerned about we like I do this?